called American Geography. And the whole point of this work was to kind of document America as if Americans had just kind of upped and left. So it's all about studying architecture, roads, how America's been sort of built into the landscape, especially in California, and like looking at national parks and that kind of thing, and how everything kind of goes into one another and, you know, freeways and all that kind of stuff, joining everything up. And um, so what I kind of, I mean, as a, as a tourist, technically, to America, every time I come here, I have this romanticized vision of America. And I was wondering, for you, what keeps you interested in documenting America? What is it that kind of excites you to go out and, and make work about this country right. as an American? Right. Well, I, I kind of share your interest in the, the built landscape of America, you know, how we've kind of uh, terraformed it and, you know, built on it, you know, with architecture and roads and motels and um, cities and weird little towns that have been abandoned. So all of that built stuff, I, I'm never tired of looking at or exploring or studying. Um, it's a different thing from somebody from another country, especially Europe, coming to the States uh, to kind of engage with this landscape. Uh, and sometimes I wonder how people see it in yeah. another way. Sometimes it's easy to see the landscape as a series of cliches and myths, which is kind of part of what it's it's built to do anyway. You know, yeah. like the, the whole Western cowboy myth, um, Ed Ruscha, just the whole history of, of turning the, the landscape, especially the modified landscape, into icons. You know, like we're surrounded by these palm trees, you know, which seem to just be emblematic. Um, but they're not native you know yeah, they're yeah, just yeah. decorations you know yeah, they're just yeah. they're just party favors stuck in the dirt yeah so what is it that um you know when you first started making making work what kind of what really just, what was the first interest that kind of drew you into what you kind of wanted to do was it really just landscape and that kind of thing or well the it? well the very first thing like a lot of kids was just taking pictures of ourselves uh jumping bikes on ramps yeah. you know and uh this kind of before we really got into skating kind of more like uh, mid 70s kind of, we we'd skated you know like the the earlier kind of you know free bearing days you know um but for me as a documentary artist as a photographer the first thing was punk rock going to punk rock shows yeah um i'd fooled around with cameras before that i was really kind of like taking kind of like boring design things you know like somebody picks up a camera for the first time it's just kind of framing but shooting bands was the first time i was really engaged well, shooting bands and audiences, shooting shows, you know, kind of from all directions. Yeah. And and that's really where uh, the spark kind of happened for me as far as trying to make and understand art. Yeah. And was that in? That was in Austin. Austin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A little bit in Dallas too. Yeah. yeah. Well, kind of between eighty and eighty four. And you were originally from Texas. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. I grew up in Dallas and then went to school in Austin. Okay. Kind of every every kid in Texas wants to escape to the cool town, which is Austin. Yeah. And then, so like, as a, as you were sort of growing into a, um, a documentary artist, d did you find, uh, I mean, uh, especially because some of the people that I've been talking to, especially like Clint or like Ray Post from Hamburger Eyes, we kind of have this whole thing of you know always having a camera on you and like documenting your life and your friends or you know just your general surroundings. Was that ever something for you, or was it kind of? Uh, specific ideas in mind that you were like, I want to work on a project like this, or was it very just kind of just keep shooting and keep making, and then it all comes together, or was it kind of more set? Yeah, I've never, I've never been one of those photographers that always goes to the camera and is kind of like gathering material like that. It's always been kind of specific projects, specific um, imagery. Um, sometimes it's uh, projects being photographed just for a, a certain printing darkroom technique. Um, but all the, as I'm going back through my old negatives and I'm seeing like when I was getting kind of like grabs from life, you know, like, ah, oh, they're precious. And sometimes yeah. I think, ah, oh, well, I wish I had shot more, you know, but you'll almost never see me with the camera. It's kind of absurd, you know, like I love and respect that kind of work. And, and I think it performs a really important function. Um, but luckily not everybody needs to do it. You know, I don't feel the need, you know, I feel the obligation to, to photograph like that. And so after... Um, getting into the punk scene in Austin, what was kind of the next? Um, freeway from, freeway from you know, kind of 
punk, as like says, it was this, a gateway culture in a lot of ways. And so um, for me, it's coming from a land without art, basically Dallas in the 70s. Um, it was a gateway into other kinds of music and into art also, you know, into you know, kind of the world of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and so by kind of 83, I was starting to listen to industrial music and jazz for the first time. Um, but Throbbing Gristle and Hunting Lodge in Soviet France and Glenn Bronk on a lot of that stuff. So that music really drove my next photography project, um, which was kind of industrial landscapes and landscapes in general. Um, still black and white, high contrast, a lot of superimposition. I was doing a lot of in-camera exposures mm -hmm. and kind of making constructed, um, sometimes film strips out of them. Yeah. And so that followed right with the punk rock stuff. In fact, in the in the in the contact sheets, you can see, you know, the punk shows started, you oh, know, you okay, started yeah. seeing, you know, well, some train graffiti shots in there and okay. also some just kind of urban, um, you know, empty landscapes. Uh, so, uh, and I mean, this is, because everyone that I kind of talk to, it's always that kind of, because I didn't want this documentary to be like, when did you make your first zine or when did you kind of do that? Because everyone has that kind of same story, like right. skateboarding, punk rock, zine making. Jeez, I know, yeah. just kind of yeah. builds on that. And yeah. then you find your different avenues up of it, but it's always the, you know, the... the Why does it always have to start with skateboarding? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, like, I can't explain it. Yeah, yeah, just some kind of that kind of sport. Because, I mean, I was the same. I was... I got into photography through photographing my friends wanting to make a BMX, like a mountain bike magazine, so we just photo each other, you know, jumping bikes and stuff. Yeah, was, like, great. Yeah, so that it's... That thing, and we'd, like, pretend with like fake shots that would do like someone would like jump onto a bench but we'd just do like each stage you know? <laughs> we didn't know how to shoot like a um, a sequence a with sequence. a motor driver or whatever yeah, yeah. So we were just like okay so they must do it like this <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah crazy. man because you just had no idea cause kids it's just like you know you just see stuff in the mags and like didn't uh -huh. have too many like videos of or any footage of someone you know making right work, right so you just the, had to kind of the world before you. um internet videos like yeah. you know and so, like, when did um, so when did more sort of movie making and kind of documentary making come into? Um, to I uh, in that same eighty three eighty four period, um, I'd met somebody who became kind of a mentor, an artist mentor, who was making Super Eight experimental Super Eight films, um, and basically turned all of us, we were living in this um, warehouse in Dallas, and turned us all onto you know experimental film and shooting Super Eights, and so. Um, kind of towards the tail end of my punk days that we were also shooting Super 8 films and they were, you know, kind of formal and based on kind of layering of photography and or landscape and movement and cine plastics. Um, and, um, and I'd also at that point, or a couple years later, saw my first Les Blank film and that's when the light went on for documentary. So then I moved to San Francisco in 87 and that's where everything kind of came together as far as like fusing experimental interests and documentary filmmaking. I mean, your, your work kind of has so many different layers to it in terms of how you present it. It's not, you know, especially when you do kind of exhibitions, there's so much of a, it's so kind of immersive in a way. But in terms of like publishing and stuff, when did, did you always, you always kind of like made zines and stuff, but what, did you always feel that your photography would like sit in a book format or was it very much just however you could kind of display it would work? Well, we, I end up fooling around with some zines. I had some friends um, in Austin that made a zine called um, The Western Roundup and I was the kind of the staff photographer. Um, and I would occasionally make little, little booklets or staple things together. I was always fooling around with Xerox, you know, like always um, at least experimenting and pasting things up. Um, but I wasn't really um, a dedicated zine maker, no. you know. Um, and although I've done a couple of kind of bookmaking projects, and as time goes on, um, I'm kind of more keen to make more like object books, you know, one of a kinds, but haven't been able to create the space to do that. Was Triax Noise like kind of it, one yeah. of the first kind of real bodies of work in a book format? Or? Um, well the first um, book book that I put out was mostly true, which um, is uh, followed the Who is Bozo Texino film. And um, it kind of takes the form of a vintage rail fan zine, like mm -hmm. a kind of a turn of the century or 1920s, you know, kind of true west kind of um, commercial periodical. 
and so that was the template for that. So, um, you know, it, it, it was kind of produced in and distributed in zine culture. It was published by Microcosm, who started as just zine publishers, and you know now they're like a big book pump publishing yeah. company, you know, and, a, and their own distributor and everything. So, um, so it was always kind of in that culture, but not seeing myself as like a regular zine maker. Yeah, I did a little, a little booklet. I just called it a booklet um, of train graffiti's early, you know, monikers. Okay. Um, that was small that I could just give to people and carry. And especially I carried it when I was riding freights. Whenever I stopped by rail workers or cops, you know, it's like, oh, officer, I'm just taking pictures, you know, where I'd use it to kind of prompt interviews. Like, have you ever seen any of these drawings? So, and that. Um, through Fact Sheet 5, oh, yeah. um, I, uh, a zine I did called, I guess I have made a bunch of zines, <laughs> one called Detour, but I only did two issues of it. Okay. I guess that's par for zine making, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> People are still waiting for delivery of issue three, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 30 years later. <laughs> and so it, it, Detour got listed in Fact Sheet 5, and somebody wrote to me and said, hey, I'd love to you know, trade for your new um, issue. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing that anymore, but I, I made this whole thing. I sent him a little Xerox thing. Oh, right. And he wrote back, you know, it's like a week there, a week back, you yeah. know, like people really had to, you had to it's have, to you know, continuity of thought. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and it was like, oh, you must know Buzz Blur, you know, this train artist, he's in your zine. I'm like, no, are you kidding? How, how would I possibly find somebody who I thought was like a railroad tramp in Fact Sheet 5? It just seemed absurd. Yeah. So. Yeah, my orbits, orbits have always been kind of within zine culture. Did you ever used to? Uh, did you ever used to do graffiti? Did you used to write on trains? Or no, you know I do a little deal that I do on trains sometimes, and um, and I have occasionally done stuff. I've done wheat paste things yeah. back, you know, uh, back in the early '80s. I would just sometimes go out and just put photos up outside, um, um, and uh, I did a stencil. Um, project in in, um, in Dallas again in that eighty three eighty four deal, but I never saw myself as really doing graffiti. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean that's because I, I became obsessed with graffiti in my like <coughs> mid teens, but I wasn't the best drawer. So I ended up once I started getting into photography, I would just photograph my friends doing graffiti. Yeah, and then we paste them, and blow them up on photocopies, and then just paste them into their pieces and stuff like that. Oh wow, and fantastic! I'd love to see pictures of that. Yeah, because I mean, as a teenager though, it's like far and few between. Obviously, the documentation. The documentation yeah, yeah, because right. One, you don't want to get caught. Yeah. And at that age, parents probably like, oh, you got a wrong film done. Let's have a look through it. There is like, I do have a few. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, definitely not as documented. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're having the most fun, when you don't have pictures of it. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So then, how did um, was the the initial interest in um, like train writing before the film or <coughs> what was sort of the lead into this into happened uh, again in 83 my god what a magic time how can we how can we possibly go back and have a life where so much happened in such a short amount of time my god <laughs> so yeah in in 83 in the middle of going to these shows I um, was out the super 8 camera um, at the train tracks next to my studio and Train was going by, and there's, you know, there was a little bit of graffiti on. There was almost no aerosol. There was no graffiti art aerosol yet, um, but I, there were monikers, and I saw this Bozo Texino, and that's what kind of started that whole project. Um, it didn't really become a film project until I moved to San Francisco in '87, and thought, aha, I'm interested in experimental film, I'm interested in documentary. Here's the perfect subject: this weird train graffiti that I'm trying to find out about. And how long did it? How long did you work on that film? Um. Well, from the time that I started seeing the uh, shooting stills and the time that I finished the film was 22 years. Wow. So, and then, and then it was just like, touring for another 10, and now yeah. it's like three years past that. Um, it was finished in 2005, and and so now the project with Bozo Texino, you know, it still screens here and there, but what I want to do with it is make a 35 millimeter print. Like a motion picture print, oh, right. so it was shot on film, Super yeah. 8 and 16. But then that was digitized and it was finished, you know, in an Avid, you know, yeah. as and then laid back to DigiBeta. So the film exists as a DigiBeta tape and a hard drive with that, you know, you know, standard def 4.3 yeah. QuickTime on it. Well, that master tape is now 13 years old. Yeah. It's going to die soon, yeah. and I can't let my film die. Yeah. So you know. 
part of my interest in still photography and black and white in particular is its longevity and its ability to travel through time and communicate across vast distances and generations. And so the ideas for Bozo Tuxino, the film, to be able to go into the future as a print. So and it's a sound idea, but it's it'll be absurdly expensive and yeah. it's not the thing, you know, granting organizations care about. And because of that such long time frame of kind of making something and, and was it self-taught in kind of learning how to do all that? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't go to school for film um, at all. But um, but uh, I feel like I got an education just living in San Francisco. You know, yeah. just living on Valencia Street and being surrounded by uh, the artist community. You know, there was so much experimental film and and so much going on just in the neighborhood. And uh, you know, just seeing films three or four nights a week. You know, mostly underground or documentary or you know. Yeah. Weird shit. So then was there like a, in like, from you making kind of that first initial filming to the, to the sort of last parts of the film, did, was there a, a big leap in how, like the quality of your filming or the, your angles or the way you kind of did? did oh did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, the film went through like, uh, like vast uh, uh, identity crises, you okay. know. First it was just going to be a little sound Super 8 film, you know, like a little Super 8 camera that had a little mag stripe on the, on the 50 foot reel and you get two and a half minutes per cartridge, you know, and I was just going to edit it on Super 8, so I was making little sound Super 8 documentaries, you know, just cutting the original. I made a couple of, of like, messenger films um, that way, and, and, but the, the Bozo Texino film, the subject, just got bigger and bigger, and my interest kind of grew, and as I was growing as a filmmaker and my ambitions were growing, I was going like, oh man, I should make a real documentary. I should start shooting on 16, and um, and I should try to get real grants and try to get it on PBS or you know apply for humanities grants, and and that's really when the when the project kind of overshot itself, you know, and at some point I realized that I was never going to become a professional you know documentary filmmaker, you know, there's just no way, you know, especially not with this film which was so full of, you know, trial and error and just slipshod, rough ass, you know, yeah. no budget, camera falls off the train kind of shit. So th at some point when I realized like I'm not it, I don't have to worry about getting it you know on PPS yeah. you know this is just gonna be a film for me and my friends and I'm like poof that was the moment of liberation and then all of the fucked up footage that I personally loved because of its its quality you know um, that would have never been you know broadcast quality yeah. suddenly all that footage was mine again you know like ah I can make the film you know that looks like the kind of shit I like. Yeah. I think I followed your... I don't know when I first discovered your work, but I think the first thing that kind of really grabbed my attention was... I think I was just going through your website and you have, like, you know, the orange van with, like, the sail on, the projector out the back, and then just going through all the old punk stuff and, like, having this kind of... the way that you um, do exhibitions like a band on tour. And... You're friends with Sergio, Sergio as well, uh -huh. and so he came to. I was running a gallery in Brighton, and he did a. Sh we got him to do a show there. And Doomed was in Brighton. No, so Doomed I had was a in gallery London, before. Yeah. Oh, Doomed, okay. Which was called Create, which was in Brighton. Oh, cool. And so Sergio did a show there, and so I've always. It's just as soon as I kind of. I don't know why I'd never even thought of exhibitions working in that way, but as soon as yeah. it clicked, I was just like, that's it, that's how you should do it. That's the, yeah. And just those one night, so in, out, and yeah. just doing it like a band. How did that first kind of, how did you first kind of start doing that? What was the in inspiration into kind of working in that way? Because did you do, were you in bands and touring? Or I, I, I toured with a couple of bands uh, just to support, you know, just you know, taking pictures and driving. Um, in 87, I went on a two month round the country tour with the Buttle Surfers um, as their 60 millimeter projectionist. And, and I also did stage lighting. I drove the Winnebago because whatever, I wasn't taking drugs. And um, and so that was, you know, like the Buttle Surfers were really advanced and like so brilliant uh, at recognizing how you could bring a multimedia thing in. I mean, now it's, it's a given. Every every live show has fucking you know yeah. 500 feet of you know projection yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and then uh, filmmakers were kind of starting to 
I guess filmmakers had toured throughout the world. They're the kino trains in Russia, and there were the traveling cinemas in Mexico in the back of a wagon and all that stuff. Um, but um, Craig Baldwin in San Francisco um, would put together short little tours, you know, like say you get flown out for a, a Cinematheque or a university in one town, and while you're there, you're like, all right, plane's paid for, let's throw some other shows, you know, on the side, or let's get a rent car, or let's get a friend to drive us to the next town and we'll do something. And so that idea had expanded a little bit, and then it was, I was just like, all right, just got to do it like a band, just book the things, make shirts, make flyers, send them out, send press releases to all the weekly papers in all the towns and, you know, m you know, make your plan on the map, your arc, and, and then bring your projectors because nobody has projectors in half the places we're showing anyway, and do a film tour. And um, in 96, Greta Snyder and I did a show called If You Left Here, You'd Be Somewhere Else Now. <laughs> and it was 16 mil mirror experimental films from San Francisco, and we did like a, a tour th across the South and Southwest, and and then back up to uh, San Francisco. It's just your two films, or as a, like a cr showing a collection. It was uh, uh, our films and a collection. Okay. So you know, it was this kind of also uh, you know hybrid role of artist curator, which I'm a huge believer in in that form anyway. Yeah. And so then I started booking more film tours, um, both with my staff and friends. And all the while working on Bozo Texino with the thought that when I finally finish this goddamn train film, I'm going on fucking tour. And I'm, you know, I would say, like, I'm not getting out of the van until I buy a house, you know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which ended up happening, actually, or ironically. Oh, wow. um, a $7,000 house in Pittsburgh. <laughs> okay, yeah. Cause di so you moved, when you were in Pittsburgh, was it kind of, so Pittsburgh's kind of, the area that, of Pittsburgh that you were in was kind of the old. Yeah, it's it Braddock, Braddock, yeah. Braddock, yeah. Uh, Braddock, yeah. Uh -huh. Steel Mill Town. Steel Mill Town. So how long were you based there? Uh, three years. Okay. And so at that point, I'd kind of had toured with uh, with Bozo Texino, uh, like, you know, pretty solid, you know, like two or three big tours a year for several years and um, and settled down for a couple of years and developed the sail van project. Um, actually, the sail van had already kind of... Jesus, Sylvan had kind of started in Portland in 2003, but by 2008, um, it had kind of scaled it up. I'd worked the, the video projections for it, had been re-edited, I got a grant for that project, and then I bought a diesel van that I could convert into vegetable oil. Okay. You know, so it was a piece about the climate change and yeah, yeah. the carbon cycle. So um, so then that the sail van tour kind of was the, the main sledge. And how was it? Was it also in the same way of being a band on tour and just turning up to spots and like hoping that people, it was never, right. you know, playing a one man and his dog? Yeah. Or was it always kind of very, you know, making sure that every every show's got like a good kind of crowd coming up? Right. Yeah. So that you had that. Because obviously you're technically the, you're the, you're doing, you're the promoter and everything. Yeah. Like right. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's DIY to death. Yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, um, the, um, well, yeah, the touring models, like you say, it's like based on this idea that um, when you do an art show, only one night counts, and that's the, the opening. Yeah. And so just make uh, a week of openings every night in another town. And so that means what you're showing needs to be portable, it needs to be fast and economical, and it needs to be something that, um, that you can kind of pitch that you can put on a poster that people can somehow figure out you know like people go like oh it's a bar it's a band we know what to expect or oh it's a cinema it's a film filmmaker and problems or, or oh it's a gallery and there's an installation you know mm -hmm. you still kind of know what to expect but when you're taking an installation that is a vehicle that drives on the road and has video on it and maybe it's in a parking lot or you know m maybe it's just on the sidewalk in front of a gallery or maybe it's in a field um, and it's a hybrid documentary. Like, how do you explain that on a poster yeah. or to the listings editor at the paper? You know, so um, so it's hit and miss. So when you're like, like I said, when you're when you're booking a tour, you want to get a balance, or at least this is the way I look at it: a balance of institutional shows that have a, a guarantee and have a budget, so you make a little bit of money there, yeah. um, and then that allows you to throw some shows in places that might either be free or might not draw some place you're taking a chance on. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, how would you kind of choose those towns just through, was, was there anywhere that you like, I've never been to there before, I'm going to head there? Or yeah, there? right. Well, choose, planning a tour has a lot to do with uh, this um, 
finding a way to embrace the land and what's built on it, like your project, American Geography is, you know, like, uh, you look at the map and go like, ah, oh, you know, look at the variation, look at these states and geography and these different towns, and, you know, whatever, there's definitely a homogenization going on in, in capitalism in American cities and global cities, you know, but mostly towns still have these, like, characteristics, you know, and you look at the map and go, like, well, there's Denver, way the hell in the middle over there, you know, um, and it's got a scene, you know, and um, it's not a place you may not end up going that often because it does mean you're kind of going across this expanse here. I end up kind of making loops through the southwest more, I guess, yeah. whatever, between Texas and California. But so trying to keep um, keep a town warm in a way by going through frequently enough to build an audience there and to kind of, in a sense, be a participant in that town, even if you're only there once every year or two. Mm. And when you're um, kind of leading kind of back around to that question of what gets you excited about, you know, that, I mean, I, I guess, do you still, when you're driving around America, are there still things that just, because it's such a, there's such a, the history isn't that old, and you have so many places where, you know, you know, 50, you've still got like, Everything from the fifties and stuff kind of scattered around. Uh -huh. like kind of, I've been talking. I was talking to some people yesterday, and she was talking about how she just loves finding those like old, like, like the big like uh, signs for like like old burger joints or like uh -huh. motor vehicle places, you know. So it's like big star, and it's like all the stuff. Yeah. And it's just you know complete Americana, and that's what she gets excited about. Yeah. And I guess because you know if I'm out in. It, it, you know, England has such a long history, and we have you know huge castles, and we got Roman walls, and all that. You know, it goes so far <laughs> yeah. back, but that stuff just doesn't. I don't go around England being like, "Whoa, look at that!" Oh, look at that. You know? yeah. And I mean, I guess there is old stuff from maybe like the eighties, seventies, like old like pubs and stuff. You're like, "Oh, right. this is kind of like a cool old." Yeah, right. Yeah, it's still got that kind of history of a of a past, but a past that I still semi remember or was born at the start mm -hmm. of or whatever. So when you're, does, does that stuff still excite you when, you when you're going out or does it just become like, just passing right. by? Well, the interstates have kind of become, you know, corporatized and sanitized, yeah. you know, and so there's there's very little of that, kind of that older Americana on yes. the interstates. Does America cherish that or is it just kind of that? Oh yeah, the whole Route 66 thing, yeah, yeah. for sure, you know, it's like, it, it, everybody has that internalized as part of their, you know, American pride and something that they feel nostalgic and and you know feel identified with, you know, the the, the roadside America. But the mo roadside America now, if you're on the interstates, it's you know just just there's like a dozen chains that you just see rotating yeah. constantly, just like you know in strip centers in, in the you know the cities. Um, but you can get off the interstates easy enough, and um, there's still a lot of crazy fucking roads, you know. And when you're touring, generally you're, you're, you're out to make money and you're trying to be as efficient as possible. Yeah. So you kind of end up on just on the interstates, you know. Um, especially if you're following routes that you've done before. But it still happens occasionally that I'll end up with a route that takes me on a highway that I've never been before. Okay. and. You know, and then there's that moment of like, wow, you know, of, of, of you know, discovery and, and seeing that, that like, you know, almost disappeared America. Mm. Have you ever made work outside of America? No, uh -uh. Right. I don't, I don't, you know, it's so hard. <laughs> like, I already carry my 8x10 camera on, a, yeah. on an airplane to, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. Maybe I'm just not very ambitious, <laughs> or maybe I just you know I, I got my hands full with America. It's it's vast, and I, I feel like you know I'm just only scratched the surface so far. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Like England's such a England's such a small. I mean you can drive from one end to the other in twelve hours. Yeah. You know? It's like, I mean you can drive for twelve hours in California and still be in California. Uh -huh. So it's just kind of it's crazy. It's it's crazy how vast it is. It's just. Um, yeah. I think that's what's so interesting about American artists is that they they're just a, they've got so much to work with. Yeah. You know, and in and in other places maybe in Europe and stuff like that there's I mean obviously there's pretty big countries but there's just not that I feel there's not that 
um, vast difference the difference between uh -huh. where points you go. Like you can go like surfing in the morning and then go snowboarding in the evening. You know, it's just like yeah, you can be in the mountains. The, well, you, you can know, do that in France, place. right? Yeah, you can do that. France, in France has got you know yeah some pretty rad geography. But I guess you don't have like the desert and stuff in France. Yeah, yeah. Things, well, yeah, so nothing. So. Yeah, um, beats Death Valley. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just it's just interesting. Yeah, I think that's part of why I'm, I'm still focused on making work here is that it, that it is, it is fast and and um, and I like I I kind of feel that cadence of the distances, you know, like um, like we were talking about. If you well, if you're driving east from here, you know, like boom, you know, Phoenix is, or Tucson is a great first day stop, you know. After that, then um, you know, then you got to contend with Texas, which is an entire day, you know, so depending on how you slice it, you know. Yeah. So boom, you know, um, Las Cruces is a great place to stop. Um, lots of cheap motels, you know. You kind of get to know where the um, cities are, the towns that have cheap hotels, because okay. not of them, all of them do, you know. But when you're on like I-10 or I-40 or the, these kind of older roads that have kind of dying towns where the the old business highway goes through and the interstate loops around the outside of them, where that kind of motel road is where you find you know your forty dollar motels. Yeah. So Las Cruces is great. Lordsburg is fantastic. Um, uh, Van Horn, um, you know. So yeah, that that feeling the the country in sections of days drives yeah. you know you can just go like oh here's a day here's a day here's a day here's north carolina here's pittsburgh boom you know here's new york you know there's yeah. one day there you know Cause this the tracks noise has just come out yeah come yeah so so th this is you know you know several years in the making <laughs> Uh, I was hoping the book would have been about 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 three years ago, but it's out this year, and I did one tour with it, and um, contemplating doing another tour with it. Um, I still and have the palette full books. You, you built, you built like a concertina kind of wall. Thing. Right. It was so like black and white and. Uh huh. So the um so as I was touring with film shows after with bands and stuff. Um, I started wanting to, to show photos, and so I would bring photos along on a film tour and try to find a place to put them up in the space, you know. And then I would start bringing flats to just lean against the wall so I'd have a place to put them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I finally hit the idea that if I'm going to do like a photo show, a real photography exhibition, I'm just going to have to bring my own goddamn walls. And they need to stand free in the place because there may be already art on the walls or there's windows or whatever. So I um, hit on the idea of just like taking pieces of four by eight um, gator foam and hinging them so they stand and then the photos are on both sides so you get like a lot of surface area yeah. you know like the the trick is maxing image area in a volume of space and so with this thing I can get you know 300 16 by 20 prints up in a small space mm. how did you attach them they're, um, the photos are matted in six, they're 11 by 14 photos matted in a 16 by 20 just foam core mat, completely okay. cheating, but they're cheap and lightweight, which really counts. Um, and there's uh, Velcro tabs on the back of them, and then there's a grid of Velcro on the boards. So the boards come out of the van, they set, you know, configure how to configure in the room. Every room's different every night, trying to figure out where what the flow should be. And then over the course of about two or three hours, quickly, boom, Velcro up all the photos and make a composition. Did you change the order every night, or did you have a set kind of? Some some areas are kind of set, so certain groupings, uh, you know, like the Misfits wall generally sticks together, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, sometimes things will mix up, and a couple of times I've just let the people at the venue um, set it up and, and edit it, you know, which is cool to see how other people would put it together. Mm. And it's interesting to see, especially this body of work, because it's all shot kind of exactly the same, the same material and the same lens and flash, how photos from 30 years apart look next to each other. Mm. So keeping the juxtaposition, you know, in flux is, is, is part of the project. Yeah, both as a book and as an exhibition. Yeah, because we had um, at the gallery at Doomed, we had a photographer called uh, Jin Satora from, do you, know, do you know that guy? I don't know. And so he um, used to photograph punk scene in Japan in 
end of the, like, I guess seventy seven kind of onwards and the sort of start of like, he used to fight with like Iggy oh. and then like a load of like Japanese like experimental punk bands Shit. had to like drive diggers into the venues and like smash stuff up and that kind of thing. Oh my god, I must know this person. I have and so it. he had a, a woman that lived in London got in touch with us about him wanting to do, never, never shown this work outside of Japan and he had all these handmade darkroom black and white prints but made on like really really thin photo paper like oh. they were photocopies I don't oh. actually know what that process oh. is print on something that thin yeah and so it's kind of like a Xerox but there's a done. proof print there was like an industrial photo printing process that was like cheap and fast on yeah. the thin paper I forgot what it was called yeah and so he came over to England and we did an exhibition of his stuff and when he uh, these were vintage prints yeah so Shit. he originally did the show in the 80s um, and just got all the bands to come and they all the bands came and put the pictures up on the wall so we just let the bands do it he put oh. up like five big prints and everyone worked around it and so when he came to Doomed he didn't speak a word of English hardly yeah and he came to Doomed and was like I'm going to put up these, like, five, six prints, and then you guys just put the rest of the show up. And we filled the whole space, and it was just like, you could go around it, like, ten times and see something. Yeah, yeah, I'm completely into that yeah. massive amount of imagery and um, kind of uh, challenging the viewer to, you know, yeah. work, you know, to, to read hard and keep reading. Yeah. Is there documentation of that show? We took some pictures of it. Is it on your site or something? Yeah. Yeah, oh, wow, I really want to see that. Um, but again, this is the thing with Doomed, because we were doing just these yeah. quick one night things, stuff just, you just get so caught up in the excitement of doing it, that stuff just gets, um, and you, you kind of think everyone's going to be there with their phones yeah. out, you know, video and stuff, but obviously, like, you know, that can be gone in a second if someone's just, you know, yeah. whatever. So it's like, Oh yeah, that's, there is this, that's a heartbreaker. We this the whole thing of, you know, we did the gallery for five years, and there's, there's not a huge amount of... And my original idea when I first moved in there was to make a film about my time there. Yeah. And, you know, you just you start off and then it's just, you know, oh, I can't bother to get the camera out tonight. Yeah. So nothing's really good. And then just, you know, continues like that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, do you have a lot... Of, did you sort of document every show that you? Fuck no, no, no! It's a tragedy. Yeah, the you know, you know, not even a one little facet of the tip of the iceberg has been documented um, in the trips. Yeah, um, it, it's it's way too hard. Yeah. Um, three years ago, four years ago now, uh, a friend of mine, Leela Lee from Hawaii, went on tour with me, and she shot film. She's a photographer, a film photographer. And um, and we were out for two months with the first kind of coast to coast Trix Noise tour, and um, and she shot those two months, and uh, and we made a zine called The Mainland, um, which is kind of the the perspective of somebody who's from an island, you know, talking about you know uh, driving twelve hours across the whole thing, you know, you drive one hour across you know, the island there, and um, she would lived in California before, but had never driven across the country and never you know. Okay. seen the Mississippi or a Waffle House or you know driven for five days straight and still not be anywhere yet yeah, yeah. you know um, so that that zine has a really uh, I think kind of uh, a magic or charmed perspective uh, of somebody seeing this landscape kind of for the first time you know, so it was expensive to make you know it's like it was nine dollars to produce you know it's like all right it's a zine it's it's perfect balance it's got a spine you know mm -hmm. but still like you know if it costs you nine are you gonna sell it for 20 you know like some people buy zines for their photo DIY photo books for 20 bucks but I don't yeah know. yes as Clint says there's no money in books yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I love books, but I can't do it. I can't. I can't. Man, it's too. Yeah. Yeah. Margin's too thin. And were you selling prints of Drake's noise on the road as well? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Like yeah. posters or the like. like no, I sell prints. I sell I sell darkened prints basically for the price of posters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> for, for smarter or dumber. And so, do you have your own dark room? In, in oh God, yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 No, I don't. Yeah, I. I have a dark room that I live in. I don't have a house. Yeah. Okay. Like I just have a. 1500 square foot shop space that is a dark room it's like a big metal building with no windows or skylights and um so i can just print in the space i can print murals you know kind of trough prop
processing. And then there's also the bathroom in the shop space is, is really big. It was overbuilt and that's the primary dark room where I print up to like 16 by 20. And then for 20 by 24 and up, I print just out in the space. But yeah, like I, you know, uh, you know, I have to have a dark room. That's yeah. like, that's it. I mean, I, I can, I can sleep on under a blue tarp, you know, but I can't print without a dark room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And have you ever, have you ever thought about uh, opening a gallery or anything like that? Is that yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I would love to, but man. Um, uh, having a gallery, especially one that might be somewhat what's successful, lands square in the problem zone between uh, audience and cost. Like every place where people live now is so fucking expensive. It's absurd. So we're kind of fucked, I believe, yeah. in a lot of ways, and not just in American cities. Yeah. That if you can, if you've any place where you're likely to get an audience for a gallery, it's just gonna be so fucking expensive. And that's what everybody's trying to figure out now. It's like fuck, every town is ruined, and you know where you know we're basically we've been living as a culture going from broken city to broken city. You know, like LA used to be cheap. You know. Yeah. And so everybody went to New Orleans, and then everybody went to Detroit, and you know. And then some of the broken cities like uh, Pittsburgh were put back together, you know, and then put back together by punks. So like Pittsburgh's now kind of one of those exceptional places where people do own their own houses, you know, punks do or artists do, you know, non-rich people and mm -hmm. have a community, you know, and they have their neighborhood and they are able to live in proximity in a neighborhood, in a community um, and, and not be just completely steamrolled by global capital like mm -hmm. LA. I think I saw some old footage of you on a rooftop in. Pittsburgh. Oh, that was in Braddock, yeah. Oh, that's a Bra yeah, in Braddock, yeah, yeah. Was that the building that you lived in? Uh, no, uh, uh in Brad, I had a, I had a studio in that building. Okay. Yeah, uh, -huh, yeah, but but I I bought this little tiny house right across the street from the mill. Uh, okay. Like one of you know, one of the few houses. There are tons of abandoned houses there, but most of them were falling over. You know, Is Braddock like a borough? It's it's its own little town, um, but it's like a borough. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. you know it's like, you know it's like nine miles of crow's flies, but it's like forty minutes to drive because it's fucking western Pennsylvania and it's just you know horse and buggy trails in the mountains. Yeah.